God, we don't take it for granted every chance we get to come together and touch and agree according to your word. And we don't take it for granted, Lord, the families you've given us, God, the lives you've given us, Lord. And our only wish and desire, Lord, is that we could be more like you to live it according to your plan for our lives, Lord. And Lord, that we don't struggle against the flesh, but God, that we walk in the Spirit. I know everyone here tonight feels the same way, and I pray, Lord, that as you guide us into those footsteps, Lord, that you'll get glory for every ounce of our life, every minute of our life, every second. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll remove us out of the way, Lord God, and that God, for your glory, that your presence will abide with us and you'll have your way. Lord, we're weak, we're small, we're few. We don't even know where we're going. But God, we know you're taking us. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you'll have your way and be glorified in our lives. And we thank you. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Last week, last Wednesday, we um, was discussing various issues of sin and, and whatnot, but uh, turn to Romans chapter 8. Um, look at chapter 7, ver verse 7 real quick. Romans chapter 7, verse 7. <clears throat> says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. The, and the commandment, which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion uh, by commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy. And the commandments, holy and just and good. And then he goes on to clarify, has what is good become death to me? Certainly not, but sin that it might appear sin. He's breaking out the, the aspect that the law was sent to reveal sin, to expose sin. And what he's, what he's using it and likening it to is saying that what the law did was awakened all manner of evil desire in him because it wasn't evil until he knew it was wrong. Does that make sense? It, was, it wasn't sin until he, real, until he was made aware by the law that it was sin. Therefore, it, it struck the chord of rebellion in all aspects of his life. And the flesh began to run wild in those things that it was now um, imprisoned by. Chapter 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now the law was to be carried out in the flesh to the letter. And no one could do it. God anointed, I mean, don't get me wrong, I mean, he anointed his priests and, and whatnot to uh, do things a certain way so that, that it could be carried out. But the bottom line is, is that no one could, I mean, if, if the law was able to be carried out in the flesh, then the priest would have been out of a job. There'd have been no need to offer up sacrifices because everybody would have had the law and the law would have been enough. 
that wasn't it. The law simply exposed, it actually increased the priest's job. <laughs> because when the law came, it exposed sin. Now all of a sudden people had to make sacrifice. But listen to this, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now understand, this is, does not mean that you are not in your fleshly body. This means that you're no longer bound by the law of flesh. The deeds of the flesh are are put to death by the Spirit of God, you're not trying to walk in your own ability. But you're walking by the Spirit of God because you recognize you don't have the ability to do anything. You can't make yourself holy. You can't make yourself pure. You can't make yourself right before God. You can't even make yourself pray. Jesus told Peter, you couldn't even confess that I, who I am if the Father hadn't shown you. So basically, those who do not walk in the flesh are, are those who have lost all confidence in the flesh. You see what I'm saying? Those who walk in the Spirit are those who have lost all confidence in the flesh because they realize it's futile, it's vanity. There's nothing that you can accomplish in the flesh. And those who still stumble are those who still have confidence in the flesh. And it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. See, now you know that he's not saying that in the flesh, talking about the, the sinful desires of the flesh necessarily because the bottom line is is that 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 war that goes on in the flesh is between the spirit and the flesh and and and, and there is a struggle there and we know that in this world we're going to have tribulation we're going to have trouble and there's things that come after us but there is something that Jesus did to set us free from that understand you know I was talking to a guy last Saturday night and he said man I really enjoyed your message it was good he said but the only thing I take exception with is the whole issue of tattoos I said well I'd love to hear what you got to say and he began to you know say well the body's the temple of God I said amen it is and I said but let me ask you a question I said do you have sin in your life he said oh, every day I said, don't you find it amazing that sinners, people who have all manner of sin in their life, that they can't get right, but boy, they can tell you that a tattoo's sin. I said, they can tell you gambling's sin. They can tell you not to drink. Not to wear your hair long if you're a man. They'll tell you all this law. But they have no idea to walk in the freedom of the Spirit of God from their own sin. So what does that place the believer in? Utter hypocrisy. There's no hope in that scenario. Because you here you are standing with a, a, a moat in your eye, picking out the speck in someone else. That's exactly what Jesus was talking about. I don't fault this guy. I mean, he's just a product of religion. But the bottom line is, a lot of people are like that. And what I'm recognizing more and more every day is that God wants us to walk in our weakness. It is, you know, they, they say Christianity or religion is for the weak-minded. I will agree. Because not only am I weak in my mind, I'm weak in my flesh, I'm weak in all aspects of life. I was talking, getting to talk to a co-worker about the Lord and I told him, I said, man, I said, whatever you do, I said, just don't forget to thank Jesus for it. I said, because I'm going to tell you right now, 
And, you know, he was telling me, man, I sit and watch you do this and I watch you do that. And, you know, it just blows me away. I said, it ain't me. I said, you got to understand something. I'm dumb as a brick. Mm -hmm. I really, really am. I mean, I'd rather be daydreaming about shooting deer than doing anything. You know, I'd rather just stare off into the space at, at, at the stars sometime and pretend that I'm up there. I am a stargazer. I am a daydreamer. It's just who I am. It's the way I've always been. That's why I struggled in school because teacher would be talking and I'd just zone out. I'd check out Planet Justin somewhere. <laughs> So I know when anything good comes out of this old boy, it is straight from Jesus. And the crazy thing is the more and more as the days go on and more I realize my own weakness, the more I see good things coming out of Justin. And I don't quite understand that other than his word is true. <laughs> his strength is perfected in our weakness. Why? It ain't that he wants us to remain weak. He just knows we can't get right. That was the whole purpose of Jesus dying. So why would he say there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus? It's because he wanted to put us at ease. You can't, you still can't fulfill the law even though Jesus did. Do you understand that God did not send Jesus to this earth to fulfill that law just so you can take the same test with Jesus' help? That's not it. No. Jesus took the test, passed it, it's done. Period. And this is the part I want to move us all into, and I really believe that, that God is, is, it's got to be true. I'll show you some scriptures here in a minute that proves it. But it's just got to be true. Look at verse 3, it says, For what the law could not do in, in that it was weak through the flesh... Why was the law weak through the flesh? Was the law itself weak? No, but the flesh was. You see what I'm saying? It's because man couldn't keep it. He would fail. It says, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Here's the key. This is literally the, answer, the million dollar answer to the billion dollar question. Walking in the Spirit is denying the strength of the flesh. It is really that simple. We've made it so hard, so difficult. And I'm telling you, as one who, who has done by example, everything you can do to try to walk in the Spirit, and you don't. Oh, you might get some steam for a while, but then pretty soon it fizzles out. Then what do you do? You have an episode of the flesh, a relapse. We're like binge Christians. That's what we are. Or should I say binge sinners? We go for a long time and we, we try to walk in the Spirit. Then all of a sudden when we get tired of the fight of trying to keep up this righteous requirement, we go off the deep end and binge sin. <laughs> and then we feel we're just like binge, like anybody who binge, whether it's drugs or food or whatever. Just like that. Because after you binge, you begin to also this horrible regret comes over you. This horrible depression comes over you. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, I was so out of control. Oh, what I, I just want to be free. Oh, God, if you'll free me from this, I'll never do it again. And you do good for a while, and then you binge sin again. Why is that? I'm convinced because we're not walking in the Spirit. We're still trying to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law that we cannot fulfill. And if we could, Jesus then died in vain. Now, which of us wants to make that claim? You see what I'm saying? Could it not be that Jesus literally died once for all, and that is it? Could it, could it possibly be? Could it possibly be that 
that what God required as payment for sin itself was paid for, for in full. And now you and I are walking, even though we have sin in our life and we are predisposed to sin, we are walking as if we have never sinned a day in our life. And it ain't based on you or me. It is based on Jesus and what he has done. And only those who are, com are comfortable walking in, in the weakness of their flesh. Now, I'm not saying you go, oh, I'm, I'm weak. I'm a drug addict, so I'm going to go out here and smoke dope and Jesus is just going to be glorified. That's not what I'm saying at all. The weakness is not in the manifestation. Hear me loud and clear when I say this. The weakness is not in the in our predisposed manifestations, whether it be drugs, sin, sex, idolatry, adultery, you name it, covetousness, lying, cheating. It doesn't those are all the manifestations of a deeper problem. So that weakness that causes us, that draws us out there to do those, to do those things is what we need to understand. And if we understand that weakness and we stop trying to hide it and mask it over with all these things, it becomes fairly easy to abstain from the manifestations, but you still have to deal with the problem. The only way to deal with the problem is through the blood of Jesus Christ. It says... In verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. It says to be carnally minded, uh, to be fleshly minded. It says, is enmity against God, for it is not subjected to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, can you get in the flesh, in the mind, and, and be carnal and be thinking about, you know, how we're going to pay our bills? What are we going to eat? What are we going to, you know, this person offended me. I'm angry. I'm mad. I'm hurt. All that's fleshly things. Can we get in those modes? Yeah. But what this is saying is those who walk in the confidence of the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. In other words, God becomes the additive. Their life is regular 89 octane. God just happens to be the high octane booster that they throw in. They're the, he's the additive. Because their minds are on the things of the flesh. You know, what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, what they're going to put on, how they're going to pay for it. You know, what does a good Christian look like? What's a good Christian do? We pray three times a day. We go to church. We go to Bible study. We go to this. We go to that. We give to the poor. As far as I'm concerned, every bit of that's carnal. It's meeting the needs of the flesh. However, when you're, when you're spiritually minded... Matter of fact, look at uh, it's, it's, uh, verse 5 again. It says, For those who are, uh, live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, what's the things of the Spirit? Well, it's very simple. Though I know we look for some big, deep theological answer, but it's very simple. The things of the Spirit is what the Spirit is all about. Now, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, temperance, patience, blah, 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 blah. What was the Holy Spirit's job? To be the helper, comforter, restrainer. He's the one that seals us through the day of redemption. He's the one that leads us through the veil of the, of the body of Jesus Christ. He's the one that washes us in that blood. He's the one that fills us and empowers us to live a life full of grace. That grace is the power of God to live a holy life. 
but it can only be found in weakness. I wish we could get that. Grace is unmerited favor. How is God going to reward somebody with unmerited favor if they have ability to earn it? You say, well, God expects us to do our part and he does his part. There is no part but God's. Period. Our part is to set our heart on him. The things of the Spirit are of Christ. The Holy Spirit leads us to Christ. The Christ, point, Christ points us to the Father, always submitting to one another. That's what they do. The things of the Spirit are, are what the Spirit is burdened about. And I promise you, it ain't about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear and where you're going to live and what you're going to ride in and all this other stuff. That's not it. You know why? Because those are nothing to Him. It's too easy. It's too simple. He has bread that we don't know of. He has a life in him that can cause us to not care about what we're going to eat or whether we eat at all. You know why Jesus fasted for 40 days? He was so caught up in the spirit. Think about it. He was baptized. The spirit of God came down in the form of a dove. The father spoke to him where everybody could hear it. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit gets all over him. He's carried away in the Spirit. The Bible says straightway he leaves and goes to the wilderness to be tempted. He fasted for 40 days before he realized he was hungry. <laughs> you see that? Why? Because he was caught up in the things of the Spirit. He was spiritually minded. After 40 days he realized he was hungry. Then here comes the enemy. The enemy could not come as long as he was caught up in the things of the Spirit. Now, Jesus, being the Son of God, had to put his body through some things just so that he could be tempted. You realize that, don't you? He could have went without food. I don't know who could go without food 40 days. Technically, but it ain't. Jesus did it. I can't go 40 minutes without food. All day I dream about food. Even when I'm eating, I'm thinking about food. Well, I'm not getting technical. We know what Jesus did. We're talking about the things of the Spirit. What I want you to see is that there is there's an ability to walk in the things of the spirit and it not it don't have to be so mysterious. See, we think the things of the spirit are when you're walking around talking to yourself and somebody asks you what you're saying, what you're doing is, oh, I'm just in the spirit. That's not it. The things of the Spirit is when you're staring at hunger. You're staring at not bills not getting paid. You're staring at ministries that seem like they fail. You're staring at relationships that are going wrong. You're staring at all this stuff. You're staring at your own weaknesses, your own sin, and you're saying, well, God, this is exactly where you said you'd meet me. I'm too weak to do anything about any of those, Lord. And you know I am. I know I am. So I'm going to wait on you. You know? And people say, no, nah, you got to do something. You got to do this. You, no, 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 no. See, that's the problem. Adam did something and it, it caused all of us to be born into sin. Jesus did something and it freed us from sin. The thing about what Jesus did that's different from what Adam did is that what Jesus did is still new every day. Sin, once it was dead, which was the consequence of what Adam did, is dead once and for all. But what Jesus did, the consequences of what he did, it makes his mercies new every day. Every day we see something different in him. Every time we open up his word, it comes alive to us in a different way because it feeds us in a different way. He's designed it to be that way. 
the things of the Spirit, yeah, God can do some pretty amazing stuff that is out of this world. But if we don't understand the simplicity of what He wants to do, you're never going to see the big mystical things that we love to hear and love to read about. If we don't get this right here, that verse 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. It means you ain't got to worry about nothing and your life will be taken care of. So how do you walk in the Spirit? You set your mind on the things of the Spirit. You know, it is very much a thing of the Spirit that when you might be suffering needs yourself, but when you see someone else, all you can think about is how you can help them and meet their need. That's Spirit. Flesh says, no, you got to save that for yourself unless you don't have enough. But Spirit says, I've got more than enough because my Father owns it all. So God, if you want me to give what little I have to this person, I'll do it. Every one of us have this little bit. When you give your heart to Jesus, he automatically deposits this remnant, this little bit. It's a small seed. It takes deep root. It takes a long time to grow. long time to develop fruit. Long time for the fruit to be any good. But let me tell you something. That little bit, if you give it back to God, it becomes something completely different. It becomes more than enough. More than you can imagine. If you learn to walk in the Spirit of God, that doesn't mean that, that you are just playing ignorant to the things that are going around. No, you're just saying God is greater than the things that are going on inside of you. It says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to, subject to the law, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but those who are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. So think about this. The presence of Jesus Christ being in you means the body's already dead. Just like the law, Paul said, back in verse, uh, verse 7, chapter 7, he said, uh, For I would not have known covetousness, Unless the law, uh, unless the law has said you shall not covet, but sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Think about that. Why was sin dead? Because it could not be judged. It, it had no consequence. It had free reign. So at one point in time, before the law came. Sin had free reign in the life of, of a person. And it was, and, and honestly, uh, there was no judgment on it. But when once the law came, look at what it says. I was alive once without the law. It says, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Is that not odd? He said, I was alive before the law came. Now most of us, we sit there and we'll go, hey, nah, you know, we were dead in our trespasses and sins before Christ came into our life. He's not talking about Christ. He's talking about the law. He said, I was alive until the law came. And once the commandment came, sin revived and I died. How did sin revive? Because the sting of death is sin. The sting of sin is death. I mean, the wages of sin is death. Okay? You would not know what sin is had there not been a consequence to it. That consequence is death. That death comes because the law said it would. 
Now, back over here, it says, But if the Spirit of... Uh, no, uh, verse 10, I think it says, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. So just like he was alive before the commandment came, and when the commandment came, sin uh, revived and he died. Well, when Christ came, sin died, and his flesh was reckoned as dead in it, with Christ. And it says this, But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So, just to wrap it all up in this, death had to come as a consequence of the commandment. And when Jesus came, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead. Christ came to kill your flesh. So the law revived sin, and you died. Jesus came, and you died some more. <laughs> but here's the greatest news of it all. See, when you died because of sin because of the law there was nowhere to go with it you're walking in death but when you die because of Christ there's something else because of his resurrection the Holy Spirit the same spirit that raised him from the dead also will raise you up and give you life Amen. now turn, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 55 real quick Isaiah chapter 55. Look at this. Oh. This is good. So verse chapter 1. I mean chapter 55 verse 1. Ho. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy, with, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Hear what he's saying. If we are, if we are in the new covenant of his, of his blood and, and, and grace, and we are still trying to purchase... Whatever it may be, holiness, faith, grace. If we're trying to do anything to earn it, we have missed the purpose of Christ's coming. It cannot be about you or what you can accomplish. It cannot be about what you are doing or what you have done or what you could ever do. It has to be about what He purposed in Himself to do way, way before you and I what he carried out in his own flesh, and what he is doing. It's all about him. It says, it says buy, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Those are the things of the flesh. Anything your flesh can conjure up will not satisfy. And we spend the majority of our time catering to the things that do not satisfy. It's really that simple. If there's anything this flesh craves and we have to give it to it, we are truly missing the mystery of what God has given us. Anybody who says, I, I've got to, I'm just like this, I've got to have this, guess what? You don't qualify for the come by without money. You know why? Because you still have strength. And in your flesh, you have strength, and your flesh tells you it won't, so you go get. 
Or you make someone give it to you. That is not what God is looking for in his children. I hear this all the time. Well, you got to do your part. Well, what is your part? Your part is to die. See, here's what happens. We, we go get baptized and we claim we're dead in Christ. And he made us a new crea creation. The only thing is we didn't let him raise us up. It says right here, or it says in Romans chapter 8, in that latter part of the uh, verse there where we was at, it said, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but, but the, the spirit of life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He'll raise you up. But it has to be him. <laughs> it says, come, buy without money. It says, why do you spend money on for that which is not bread? Your wages for what does not satisfy. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. See, people take this and they just start going around manipulating dipping people, trying to get them to give them stuff now. The Lord wants you to live in abundance, so you need to give me so I can live in abundance, and God will give you in abundance. There's a reaping of sowing and sowing part of our lives that we have to understand it's a law and it doesn't change. But what this is talking about has nothing to do with the things of the flesh. It says. It says. Let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear. And come to me. What is the thing that we're supposed to. Uh, eat. And it's good. Jesus said. Take this bread. This is my body. Eat of me. If you don't eat of my body and drink of my blood, you'll have no part with me. God said that is good. In fact, he said it's good enough. In fact, he said it's all I need. It's enough to set right every wrong that's ever been done. It's enough to wipe away the sin of humanity for all those who will believe. And he says... And this is more evidence of what he's saying because he says, he says, incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live. It's talking about returning to God, coming back to God. And, and it says, I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David, indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you, because the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Then it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. And it says, And he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There's a whole lot more in that chapter that I just can't go through tonight. But let me tell you this. Your, your job and my job is to turn to him. That is it. Yeah. Turn to him. Turn from our ways, our, our, our flesh, our abilities. Our, I know I say this at work all the time, and, they, and I don't know if they really get it, especially the guy who always talks to me about it. But I'm telling them, like, dude, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't. And, and it ain't all been perfect. But I'm talking about welding. When I get up there and I start welding, all I can see is I, I want to weld. When I was praying, I was seeing weld. There's something about it. You heat it up. 
and you fuse metal together. And the more I think about that, the more I realize that as God turns up the heat in our life, it fuses us with Him. It melts away all this stuff. Now, if you get it too hot, it'll start bringing all this dross to the top of it. And it becomes hard to make it look pretty. See, God in that aspect don't mind. He knows how to clean it. But if you get the right heat, it penetrates. And what was two separate pieces become one. I love that idea. <laughs> I love it. And here's the part that really gets me. Is that, man, you can do this. You can do that. You can, No, I cannot. I told him, I said, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That means I come to him weak. He makes me strong. You're seeing the after effect. You're seeing the strong. But you don't know me because I'm the weak one. It's that simple. As long as I come to him weak, he makes me strong. You get the benefit from it. You get to see the benefit of it. But if I ever come to Christ, weak or not weak. Matter of fact, you know how you you know how you start to walk in your evidence of you starting to walk in your own strength. It's very simple. The very first thing you do is something you don't do. You don't go to Christ. Because you don't need him. You know, I view every chance we get to kneel on our face before God and agree together. A time of prayer, a, a, a privilege and an opportunity that Jesus might show up and inhabit the prayers and the praises of his people. I know one of these days we're going to do that just out of obedience and, and faithfulness and out of our own weakness. And for whatever reason, God's going to say that today's the day. He's going to show out. And show up and show out in such a way that it's gonna it's gonna change our lives forever, and not just us though. He's not doing it for us. He's doing it for all those that we're gonna lead to Him because of our willingness to walk in our weakness. And yet we we begin to get confident in our own flesh when we do not go to Him. I have done that for many years. I was under the impression. God didn't save me to make me S-T-U-P-I-D. He saved me. And now, you know, I was always taught that I, there's things I have to do. God expects me to do certain things. That's so far from the truth. All he expects me to do is come to him. And then... In, in, in my weakness, whatever it is that I do, his strength is magnified because I came to him in my weakness. Y'all might not know this. I forgot about it till the day when I was thinking about it. I'm, pro I'm probably uh, one of the scariest things that I ever do is talk to people, stand up and talk to people. I got to thinking about it. I was like, well, I could do it in a drop of a dime. I won't even blink. I won't even think about it. But if I unravel myself, I actually realize I'm still just as scared as I've ever been. The only difference is I came to God in my weakness. He showed up. And I'm so used to Him showing up that it's okay for me to stay weak. You know what I'm saying? I, I, don't, even, I don't even have the desire to make people think that I know what I'm talking about. It's not in me. I know I come to God in my weakness and He's always showed up concerning His Word. Always showed up concerning His Word. And I just go with it. Lord, it's you. It's you. Do what you do. But if I, if I sit and I think about it, man, I'm still just as scared as I've always been. It's amazing what God's faithfulness and His presence in your life, how it overshadows your own fears. But it says, I will abundantly pardon. Do you know what that means? 
Do you know what a pardon is? It, a pardon can only be given to someone who is utterly and completely guilty. You're caught. You're guilty. There's no, in other words, that part don't even go to court no more. It's over. It's done been settled. You're guilty. You know, like for example, someone gets the death sentence. They have a certain thing where a governor can pardon somebody. Well, they're guilty as guilty can be. The thing that can change is whether or not they live or die. You see, if man has the ability to do that, in the flesh, what what is the pardoning that God gives you and I? He said, I will abundantly pardon. Long and short, it says this. Every single one of you, even the little ones, you're guilty. I'm guilty. Because I came to Christ in my weakness. Because you came to Christ in your weakness. He says, I pardon you. I pardon you. Stay humble before me. And you'll walk through this life in my grace, in my blessing, in my pardon. And you will not be in a scenario where those things will overtake you. Because I myself will overtake you. But if you walk in your own strength, according to the things of the flesh, God is not going to compete with you. He's not. Not that he can't. And at some point in time, should you remain st stubborn enough, oh, he, he will break you down. But his grace is such that for those who truly love him, even when you can't get it right, he says, I pardon you. Just come to me. Just turn to me. Hear me. That's what he said. Hear me. Hear me. Eat. Feed yourself with me. And you'll live. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We love you. Thank you for your abundant pardoning. Thank you for your life. For raising us up, Lord God. Thank you for your death. Thank you for our death. Lord, we're reckoned dead in Christ. But alive in him because he rose from the dead. Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you. That you desire us to come to you in our weakness. Lord, that you're not looking for us to come to you when we got it all together. You want us to come to you in our weakness so that in our weakness you can be made strong. Lord, help us not to get caught up in our manifestations of our weakness. Those things are, are Satan's playground. He loves to use those things to condemn us. But as we read in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk in the confidence of the flesh but in the confidence of the Spirit. We don't trust in our abilities to do things that you want us to do, God. We trust in your spirit to do them in us. If we could do it on our own, Lord, you would not have had to come. But you did. And that tells me, Lord. Our weakness is ever before you. I think it's just now becoming before us. And I pray, Lord God, that we'll embrace it. And we'll let you do with it whatever it is you want to do with it. And God, what you strengthen in us, you strengthen in us. And the weaknesses in us that cause you to be strong, Lord, I pray that, that it will, Lord, just overtake those around us. Fill us, Lord, afresh every day with this wine and this bread without price. Lord God, that we can walk in the Spirit and see you do what you're going to do in these last days. Open our eyes to the things of the Spirit, Lord God. We ask it in Jesus' holy name. Amen.